let's talk about bird ancestry. From which group of animals did birds evolve? This question has occupied paleontologists' attention for a long time, and it's made difficult because bird skeletons are fragile, and the fossil record is therefore relatively poor. Nonetheless, most would agree that birds evolved from reptiles. And in 1867, Huxley, who was the comparative anatomist uh, who in 1860 debated Wilberforce and supported Darwin's theory, uh, he was the first to suggest a formal classification scheme that placed birds and reptiles in a single group, the Sauropsida. And he, in fact, once called birds nothing but glorified reptiles. Well, how does he know? How do we ever know who's related to whom? Well, one way we work out relationships among living organisms is to use uh, cladistics. This is a method that uses strict rules for judging relationships. And the main rule is that only characteristics that are derived and uniquely shared should be used to determine relationships. So uh, in phylogenetics, a derived trait is a trait that's present in an organism but was absent in the last common ancestor. So, so if you if you evolve some weird doodad that that's, you know, springs out of your left arm uh, and your ancestors didn't have it, that's a derived trait. Okay, so here are some of the derived characters shared by birds and reptiles. Uh, first, they have one rather than two occipital condyles. So take a look at the skull in lab. You'll see uh, that the skull rests on the atlas, you know, with a single, there's a single condyle there. Two, lower mandibles. They're composed of several bones, not a single dentary bone, and these bones articulate with the quadrates, not the skull proper. That's very reptilian. Three, the ears. Ears have single bone for transmitting sound uh, to the inner ear. The columella is that bone. Let's uh, take another look here. Here's the single bone columella in birds and reptiles. They share this. Mammals, on the other hand, have, have the uh, malleus incus stapes system, three bones transmitting sound to the inner ear. Four, both birds and reptiles lay yoked eggs, and both have an egg tooth on the upper mandible at hatchings to, to, to enable the critters to break out of the egg shell. A fifth thing, they both have nucleated red blood cells. And there are many, many more derived characteristics, but these are the five of the key ones. In addition to these things, far and away, the most convincing evidence, not only of the closeness of birds and reptiles, but of reptilian ancestry, comes from the Jurassic fossil Archaeopteryx lithographica. Here's the Berlin specimen and that has become the Rosetta Stone of Archaeopteryx fossils. Now, there are something like seven, eight specimens that have been recovered from the Solnhofen limestone quarries near Bavaria. Uh, and this bird, Archaeopteryx, was a pigeon-sized critter that would unquestionably have been classified as a reptile were it not for the presence of feathers. I mean, look at that. You can see the feathers. It's clear. But if you take the feathers away, it's amazing. It looks like reptilian characteristics. So Archaeopteryx shared a lot of derived characteristics with reptiles, but also, also shared derived characteristics with birds. So it's a perfect intermediate stage between the two groups, reptiles and birds. Let me give you some examples here. The skull is very reptilian. It's a heavy structure. There's no bill. There are teeth in the sockets. Two, the ver vertebral column is very reptilian. There are fewer sacral vertebrae, like six, and more free caudal vertebrae, like 20, than in any known bird. And, and all these are biconcave, so very reptilian. Uh, three, rep, uh, the ribs are reptilian. They're not jointed, take a look here. No uncinate processes. And there's even some abdominal and cervical ribs present. So again, very reptilian characteristics. Four. The pectoral girdle, on the other hand, is very avian. There are fused clavicles that form a furcula. The fifth thing, the pelvic girdle, it contains both avian and reptilian characteristics. 
There are three pelvic bones held together by ligaments. They're not fused like they are in birds. However, the backward facing, uh, backward facing pubis is distinctly avian. Then the arms and hands contain both avian and reptilian characteristics. The ulna is unusually stout and there are unfused clawed digits. That's very reptilian. But there are feathers present and the number of digits is also reduced, which is avian. Finally, the legs and toes both uh, uh, contain avian and reptilian characteristics. The fibula is as long as the tibia, that's reptilian, but there are four toes with one opposing the others, and that's very bird-like. So you get the idea. This critter was very intermediate in many respects between reptiles and birds. So Archaeopteryx was definitely on the road towards some bird-like critter, but was reptilian at the same time. So the interesting question becomes, well, which reptile group would have given rise to Archaeopteryx? Well, what are the possibilities even? We have, we have to go back, back in time. Let's go back to the Mesozoic era to see what sorts of reptiles were running around back then. So we have to review our geologic time periods. Uh, there are three eras represented here, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras, and then uh, a bunch of periods in the red, green, and yellow uh, that we all had to learn in you know, first year biology. So if we focus in on the green and yellow, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous periods, and then tertiary, quaternary, here we are. So notice about 160 million years ago in the Jurassic, mid to late Jurassic, that's when the first birds, when Archaeopteryx uh, was running around. So we have to ask ourselves what reptiles were running around during that same time period. And here is a classification scheme of Mesozoic reptiles. So let's go back. Mesozoic, there we are. See the Mesozoic era. What reptiles are there? Here are the Mesozoic reptile groups. There were six subclasses. Uh, the synapsids gave rise to mammals, right? So that's not a likely group to have given rise to birds. The anapsids, the roof-headed reptiles, gave rise to turtles. The lepidosaurians gave rise to lizards and snakes. The uriapsids gave rise to synapsosaurs, which went extinct, and ichthyopterygians gave rise to ichthyosaurs, and they also went extinct. So we have five of the six subclasses unlikely to have given rise to birds because they led to something else or went extinct altogether. So the archosaurs, the last subclass, that's the group that would have been likely to give rise to birds. Now within the ruling reptile group, the archosaurs, there are five orders. Thecodonts, crocodiles, pterosaurs, ornithischians, and saurischians. And you have to look at those groups and decide, try to decide which one of them might give rise to birds. Um, if we flip this classification so that we look at it in a tree-like form, it looks something like this. We have the thecodonts at the base. That's a basal group. So go back again to the classification. The thecodonts is a basal group. They were extinct by the Jurassic. And one example of a thecodont is Euparcaria, which is a pseudosuchian thecodont. Okay, so thecodont's the basal group. Then, then after that basal group, we have the crocodiles, pterosaurs, the ornithischians, things like stegosaurs and triceratops, and finally the saurischians, the reptile hip dinosaurs, which are, are two subgroups or suborders. Theropods, like Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus rex, these bipedal types, and the sauropodomorphs, the brontosaur-like critters. Take a look again at the tree. There they are, the basal group thecodonts, pterosaurs, crocodiles, there's the brontosaur-like ornithischians, and then the saurischian group, which has the two subgroups, the bipedal saurosaur and carnosaurs, and the brontosaur-like sauropodomorphs. Okay, so which of these groups would have given rise to birds? That's the $64,000 question.
Archaeopteryx came off of one of these lines eh, 160 million years ago. Heilman, in 1926, believed that some Thecodont, Pseudosuchian, gave rise to pterosaurs, crocodiles, dinosaurs, and birds. So the basal group gave rise to all those other groups. If you take a look at the skull of something like Euparcaria, which is a Pseudosuchian Thecodont, on top there, it has a teeth set in sockets. Its hind limbs are longer than its forelimbs, has a backward facing pubis, its fifth toe is reduced. Um, it's thought to have given rise to Archaeopteryx in the middle there, which then was on the line toward birds at the bottom. There's a pigeon skull. So this basal group probably independently gave rise to all these other groups, crocodiles, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and birds. That's Heilman's argument. And here it is illustrated on our little tree. So Thecodont's basal group give rise to all these other groups independently. And there comes Archaeopteryx off of a bird line. And it goes extinct sooner or later, while modern birds uh, continue on that line. Now, it turns out the Silurosaurian dinosaur group that line, share more anatomical characters with Archaeopteryx than did any other Mesozoic group. But because they apparently lost clavicles, right, that would be a derived state, it's hard to imagine re-evolving clavicles on the way to modern birds, which do have clavicles. So if it weren't for this absence of clavicles, Heilman would have linked birds with Solarosaurus because there are so many similarities. But the general feeling early on was dinosaurs and pterosaurs themselves were too specialized to have given rise to birds. And the birds must have split from some generalized group earlier. And this view uh, remained virtually unchallenged uh, for over a half a century. Then, in 1972, Walker come, came along. He suggested birds evolved instead from an early crocodilian. It turns out birds are more closely related to crocodiles than to any other living reptile group. And this has long been known on the basis of uh, similarities in the heart, the, the crocodile's three-chambered heart on the way to birds, skull similarities, and other things. Now, most people believe these similarities evolved independently uh, from uh, a derivation uh, from an ancestral thecodont. But Walker and some other people, Whetstone and Martin, find lots of other similarities in dentition um, and the, the eye sockets and various other things to have been, become convinced that uh, birds came off of that crocodile line. This crocodile origin idea seems to have received little support, however. So most people believe that birds either have a thecodont origin that basal group is the one that gave rise to birds, or a more recent origin from already existing dinosaurs. Now, the reason I stress the dinosaur group is that Ostrom, in 1973, comes along and championed just that kind of argument. In a page-long paper in Nature, he noted the skeletal anatomy of Archaeopteryx is entirely that of a Silurosaurian dinosaur, not a Thecodont or a crocodile. Many theropod features are clearly shared by Archaeopteryx. These include things like amphicelous vertebrae, similar number of vertebrae, forelimb similarities in the hand and the position of the metacarpals, and the, the, the hind limb similarity in the number of toes and proportions and the joints, and pelvic similarities in the shape of the ilium and the backward facing pubis and the acetabulum. Um, these similarities were much more striking to Ostrom than were the few similarities between Archaeopteryx and Thecodonts. In fact, he said, the last three specimens of Archaeopteryx were misidentified as Silurosaurian dinosaurs and put in the wrong drawers in the museums. Not only that, Ostrom says, several kinds of Silurosaurs, including things like Velociraptor, have clavicles. This was the one thing Heilman was unaware of in 1926 and kept him from going the dinosaur route. Clavicles are relatively delicate bones, therefore in danger of being destroyed or at least damaged beyond recognition. So 
So he just didn't know that there were clavicles in many of these uh, Silurosaurian dinosaur specimens. Clavicles have been found in theropod dinosaurs before, uh, they were found before Heilman wrote his book, but he went, uh, he, these went unrecognized by him until about, uh, and weren't known until about the 1970s. And that's what Ostrom capitalized on, that knowledge. So the link between birds and the Silurosaurian dinosaurs seems pretty strong. Now, on top of all the morphological details, um, there was a good deal of deba debate in the 70s about whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded or not. So this kid, Bacher, who was a graduate student in the 1970s, a Harvard fellow, pointed out not only striking similarity between Archaeopteryx and small carnivores found in Bridger, Montana, but he supported um, the idea that these were probably warm-blooded critters as well. And he looked at things like predator-prey ratios, the ratio of predator to prey in these fossil beds. Warm-blooded animals, right, are going to need more prey to support themselves because they have a higher energy requirement. Cold-blooded critters have different ratios of predators to prey. And he found the predator-prey ratios are similar to warm-blooded critters. Also, the distributions of many dinosaurs are in cold areas like Montana. And then finally, bone structure is much like those, uh, you know, like the Haversian canal system inside the bone, long bones, much more like warm-blooded than cold-blooded critters. So here's another person, Jack Horner, at Montana State in the Museum of the Rockies, right? He began studying social systems, what appeared to be the social system of dinosaurs, uh, looked much more like the, the care that warm-blooded critters give uh, their young. So he wrote a lot about mama dinosaur taking care of babies and finding eggs and clusters and nests and other anatomical uh, features that suggested that these really were warm-blooded animals as well. So what we're trying, what I'm telling you is there's a lot of similarities, derived characteristics, whether it's behavioral or anatomical or physiological, that link dinosaurs to birds. So we have tons of similarities, derived characters, linking the two groups, but the question is, are these similarities due to ancestry because they're related to one another or convergent evolution? Those are these only two possibilities. If you share a bunch of characteristics, either you had a similar ancestor that had those characteristics or, or you evolved them independently. Now, most everyone believes, oh my gosh, there, it's clear indication that these things are related. But there are three things that keep many people, especially ornithologists, from accepting dinosaurs as ancestors. And you ought to be familiar with these arguments. First, some people say, the similarities that you're giving me in anatomy are just too superficial. Yeah, right, they have eyes. Yeah, right, they breathe. Yeah, they have scales. Yeah, come on, give me a break. These are hardly unique derived characters. And they argue uh, some of the unique-like features that each of the two groups have aren't shared. Okay, so scapula, quadrate, teeth, claws, reversed hallux are not shared by many ground-dwelling theropod dinosaurs. So that bothers a lot of people. Number two, the timing seems wrong. The dinosaurs that are most similar to birds, when you really begin to find really similar dinosaurs, they occurred in the Cretaceous, which is 80 million years after Archaeopteryx is around. If you want to argue that something gave rise to birds, it's got to be around before Archaeopteryx showed up. And third, it seems to require a ground up rather than a tree down origin for flight. If you're evolving from a ground dwelling bipedal runner, how, how are you going to get flight? That seems biophysically impossible to many. Okay, I'm going to address each of these three, and we're going to address each of these arguments and show you that they're bogus, and clearly birds are related to dinosaurs. First, even though some people argue similarities are superficial, there are many, many derived characters that are shared, and they're not superficial at all. So you look at the pubic bone there, you look at the hand and the structure of the manis, you look at the clavicles and the fused clavicles, and on and on and on. So, so most people say, oh, come on, give me a break. There's a lot of derived characters that are shared. And the second concern 
of not sharing some things that are unique. Well, any two taxonomic groups have characteristics that aren't shared. Good grief. So that's the counter argument. Number two, the timing. It turns out many fossils are from the same time period. So the argument that, they, that, that the good similar fossils, the fossils that are similar to birds occurred way later than Archaeopteryx, you know, is not well founded. There's Ornitholistes, Silurus, Compsognathus, and others known from the late Jurassic age. So that's getting pretty darn close. And there are brand new finds of lots of feathered theropod dinosaurs and even structures within the feather-like filaments in the integument of non-avian dinosaurs, so dinosaurs running around, not birds, from the mid-Jurassic before Archaeopteryx. So this second concern seems to uh, have been addressed as well. Here's a neat Science News Online article that came out in the basically stating that feathers are present not only in intermediate Archaeopteryx, but in many dinosaurs as well. And in their words, in the academic cockfight over bird origins, dinosaur researchers have discovered something to crow about. Two species of feathered dinosaurs have turned up in China. This is the most important dinosaur discovery of the century, says so-and-so. Um, now, most of the people that, that, that are critical of this idea, you know, they maintain that these uh, feather-like structures are not down, but they're actually reptilian frill, which is something totally different. But the other people argue, come on, give me a break. These are basically feathers. The structure's totally similar. And, you know, come on, take a close look. It's pretty convincing. So here's one of those feathered dinosaurs, Sinosauropteryx, from China. And you can see the little fuzz going down the back and down the tail. And what's really amazing is paleontologists have now uncovered more than three times the number of new species of Mesozoic birds over the last 10 years than they have during the last 200 years. So there's been an explosion in finds. And there are tons of feathered critters that are undeniably birds by the Cretaceous, certainly. And here's Confucius Ornus of China uh, and a skeletal reconstruction of that sort of pigeon-like bird and you can see the feathers clearly, feathers on the tail there. So certainly by the Cretaceous, we've got, there's no question, there are bird-like critters running around. But there's a whole slew of recent feathered dinosaur discoveries and earlier from the mid-Jurassic of China. And this certainly supports a dinosaur origin of birds. The very latest find is fossilized melanosomes, which are color-bearing organelles embedded within the integumentary filaments of non-avian dinosaurs. So you go to the fuzz on the tail, and inside there you see little organelles that are melanosomes. This is what Zhang et al. just published uh, two, three years ago. Now, people have come back saying, oh, I don't know about the strength of that study. The kind of science they're doing is pretty sloppy. This paper here by Lingham Solier says, oh, come on, those aren't melanosomes. That's just collagen, you know. It's not color-bearing organelles in feather-like filaments. So you do get argument going back and forth, but I think, by and large, all in all, recent discoveries related to the studies of eggs, behavior, integument, even protein structure suggests beyond any reasonable doubt that birds evolved from Silurosaurian dinosaurs sometime before the late Jurassic. So modern birds and theropod dinosaurs share unique derived characters because birds are dinosaurs. So here's a recent book from 2007 that emphasizes where we are with our knowledge of bird origins. We're right back where we started with Huxley. Birds are nothing more than glorified dinosaurs. So what's the problem? All doubts about dinosaur ancestry have been erased, right? Well, maybe for paleontologists, but not for the ornithologists. Many ornithologists seem to have one more sticky issue that makes a dinosaur ancestry hard for them to accept. And that is how a bird could evolve from a ground-dwelling runner. How do you get flight out of that? 
it turns out this is an easy issue to address as we'll talk about you know in a couple of lectures so just know now that this uh, lingering resistance is from a small group at this point uh, there are plenty of ways to see the evolution of flight from a bipedal critter well by the Cretaceous we start picking up numerous modern like birds uh, most are grebes and cormorants, herons. During the Paleocene and Eocene, roughly 80% of all orders of birds are recognizable. So you can be back that far in time and recognize things as belonging to particular orders. So the real radiation of bird types occurred by this time period, you know, 60 million years ago. I mean, there were some weird critters running around back then. You know, here's a North American bird in the Eocene, Diatroma a large flightless ostrich-like bird with a horse-like skull. You know, and many fossils of this time have been recovered from the La Brea tar pits, uh, tar pits just south of the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood, where, as my vertebrate biology professor used to like to say, there are still weird birds roaming around. Go down to Hollywood any, any night and you're going to see some strange birds. Well, most families were recognizable by the Eocene-Miocene epoch, most genera by the Miocene Pliocene, and most modern day species are recognizable by the end of the Pleistocene. So you could go back that far and find something running around, and you would have been able to recognize it as one of the modern day species. So that's the story of the evolution of birds.